went on a rally in Chesterfield and the delegate at Dinnington Pitt came to me and said, um, when's Dinnington going to have a, a women's support group then? Because obviously in uh, other areas of the country, other groups had started up. Mm -hmm. um, so I went away and thought about it and I just got a few of my friends together and we called a meeting and it went on from there. Mm -hmm. Our branch um, didn't want women involved. Um, Pat and some others were trying to form a, a, a group, you know, a support group, um, and the rest of uh, our uh, branch were against it. Um, so I told them to pick it, the, uh, the union meeting, um, which they did, and lads won't cross pick it. So branch officials, and I were one of them, but you know, I were for it, but the rest of them weren't. So they had to listen to them. They were allowed into the meeting. Because as you said, that it's, we weren't, we never had, you know, we'd have uh, union meetings. Um, no women were at, at them union meetings. So they weren't used to that. So when, when they actually came in and spoke and said what they wanted to do, it were a completely new thing. To, to all the union officials and rest of men. I'm from Armthorpe, I work with Mark and Main Colliery, and uh, I got involved in the strike, going out picketing, collecting money and things like that. And you did a lot of speaking as well, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was your nickname, tell us? Gobshite. <laughs> Why did you get that nickname, Aggie? Well, first of all, my very first... Um, meeting was a big place at university in Sheffield and I met up with Sammy Thompson, he was one of our union men next door to Arthur Scargill and I says, you're going to have to help me with this speech, I don't know what to say. He said, I'm not helping you. He said, you've been out there, you've done it, you've seen it. Oh, you say, it comes from art and memory. I thought, bloody hell, why do you think I took in our memory box? and they had to get me an orange box to stand on because I'm not that tall. So we're on there and I'm thinking, oh God, look at all these people, what am I going to say, what am I going to, oh God. Anyway, I just started babbling on and telling them what were happening and how we were collecting, how pe people were being so generous towards us. And um, I said, I didn't have to write mine down because I've seen it, I've done it. And honest to God, they all stood up and applauded me. I couldn't believe it. Because my legs were still shaking, my stomach was churning. And I thought, oh, God, you know. And I come out and people are coming up to me really nice, you know. And I thought, you've cracked it, girl. You know, so. I knew a lot of women who had held jobs down and did soup kitchens and, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, I did my bit. We used to go out and do, like... Um, car boot sales and mm -hmm. things like that, you know, to raise funds as well. And everything, every penny we raised went in to a minus fund, to the fund, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the, the men weren't getting anything at all. Yeah. And I mean, me, me husband's mother occasionally used to send him, she was a pensioner and she used to send him £10 every now and again, you know. Yeah. But when you think about it though, is it, <laughs> I think, I mean, if you look, you go back to 1926 strike, there were women uh, running soap kitchens, you know, when you, you, you take that, that kind of history of it. What changed in, in 84 is that they didn't, yeah, they did the soap kitchens and they did food parcels, but I don't think uh, that it were expected that they'd actually take it a step forward and actually go on picket lines. You know, they actually had women picket, you know, they had their own separate pickets uh, at that time as well. You know, and I don't think, I think for a lot of people, that were a kind of a major difference that they actually didn't just uh, cook food and didn't just provide food parcels. They actually took a physical uh, presence in strike and actually went on picket lines. Yes, and how do you get involved? Well, it was with uh, my first husband being a miner and uh, at the local club where we used to go, 
and it was when they started, when the miners' strike came on, a lot of women were getting involved, they were down doing the dinners, and then uh, just, get, you know, trying to do get meals for the miners when they were coming off, when they'd been picketing. And uh, that was my first step. And then it went on that it were coming up to Christmas and they got the one to, to do something for the kids. So we got that going as well and having all stuff delivered, you know, so we could make it for the kids. Just that's how I became involved and it went on from there and we did whatever we could when, you know, to try and ease it for people. My wife now were married to a miner that was on strike and yet she were on, on a full-time job. She were bringing three children up and she still found time two, three hours a day before she uh, went to work, when she was on afternoons, she used to go down helping, putting meals on for lads when they came back from picketing. Uh, well, I worked for the coal board. Oh, did you? Yeah, in coal house and um, in the library. And um, I was also a Doncaster councillor, so I uh, actually, because I was a councillor and a Labour councillor, yeah. I, uh, that's how I became involved because it was obvious that, you know, I couldn't mm. carry on working. I mean, it was a bit of a, it was a difficult decision to make because you, you're letting people down. Mm. My missus was not so much an, an active support, it was more, she was, she kept on doing the work, but at the end of the day, when you come home and you're stressed out and things are getting on your mind, yeah. within the first day of the strike, we had people who were trying to uh, undermine us. And I'd come home sort of stressed out and, and the comfort was there for you. Uh, so I couldn't, couldn't manage any other way. We'd all gather together in one house so that we'd only got to light one fire. And, yeah. And so everybody would gather with a, a big throw lounge, so there were plenty of room. So I think I remembered a lot of lessons from my grandmother um, and why she was so thrifty during the, the war. Yeah. And I mean, I always remember balls of string that were made out of um, tights, cut them up into strips right, and tied yeah. it together. Yeah. So it, you'd learned how to, well, how to do things. Yeah, that, uh, there were a cheaper way of dealing with things. And I remember a situation where we were burning old shoes and anything we could get as hands on to, to actually keep a fire yeah. going. We, we were a bit isolated, really, oh, because yeah. there were only about seven of us on strike and co coal oh, house. Right. Um, um, we, we were in COSA, the uh, NUM COSA, um, but um, there weren't many at all in coal house. And um, so you were quite isolated ah. um, but um, we did uh, as NUM COSA mm. we did organize to help the members that were on strike uh, of, uh, of that you know the NUM COSA bit because mm. there wasn't the same attitude towards them as there was to you know local you know men, to yeah. the local miners there were so few of us mm. and so there wasn't that same camaraderie but there were you know yeah. We did, the union did help the miners or the mine workers, not not actual miners, yeah. um, with you know food and stuff. But it yeah. wasn't quite it wasn't quite the big thing no, that the no. NUM itself was doing. It went on that it were coming up to Christmas, and they got they wanted to do something for the kids. So we got that going as well and having all stuff delivered, you know. I enjoyed it, even though I did a full-time job, days and afternoons. And at Christmas time, we were all thinking, oh God, you know, how we're going to get through Christmas this year. And these men from down south, they just all came, they rang us up and said, we've got a load of presents for the kids for Christmas. Is there anywhere where we can store them? And we had a dining room. And I says, well, yeah, you can store them in the dining room, thinking there was just going to be like a couple of sacks. <laughs> and there was boxes from the ceiling to the floor of these Christmas presents that they'd got for the kids. Mm. And everyone was individually wrapped. Everyone had um, an age and a sex on it, so that each child got what was 
really for them, you know. Yeah, well, we had similar for the Christmas party. It was uh, Rolls Royce workers that uh, raised money for that. And uh, they came up and they brought um, Arsenal's photographer with them. So we've got some really nice photographs of that. Mm -hmm. the, there was a different perspective and a different momentum about the 1984-85 um, the strike. We knew from the start it was going to be a hard slog. We'd had all the warnings and predictions about that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we were, we were thinking it was about our families and we were thinking about our, uh, our children's futures. And, and at the end of the day, we couldn't have managed, as Dave says, we couldn't have managed those 12 months w with, without support. My wife um, were uh, really shy. Um, and you'd never have thought that uh, she would get involved in a, a strike or get involved in things that she did during strike. She did an absolutely amazing job organising a uh, women's group. She put uh, a lot of hours in. She was an amazing person and so were the rest of women. And I think that uh, we, we'd never have survived as long as we did if they hadn't have done what they did. Um, and I'm really proud of her. No, no one knows but her. So this is by Aggie's daughter who was 10 at the time at the strike. No one knows but her. She's alone, her mind ticking over, the problems she's got to face. No money, no food, no coal. Maybe soon, no home. She's along, alone with wandering thoughts. She cries a little and sighs a little. I wish I could get inside her mind to ease the pain and make it better. She's alone shaking her head. I know that she's got it solved. But what keeps her going? She's a sayer, she's strong. She's my mother. I mean, minor strike, it led me to swear, because I didn't ever swear before a strike, to be quite honest. Because I always used to say, uh, when, before a strike and all that, I used to say, I must have been a bloody clockwork doll. People, these jury batteries settle batteries in me and says, right, you can make breakfast, then you come to your mates, go do shopping, come home, do cleaning, get kids from school. And that's exactly, he never said that to me, but that's how I looked at myself, as a clockwork doll, doing them duties, uh, following my mum's footsteps, because, like, when Pete finished his day shift, there was something on table for him. When he finished afters, there was something on table for him. You know, it was like everything were built round Pete and kids, you know. Um, I don't clean up now, he does it. There's things I never thought I'd do, there's things I'd never thought I'd say. Um, and I just can't get out of them habits now. Mm. But it's not habits, it's... I'm a stronger person than what I ever was before.